Thanks very much. Uh, right, so now for something completely different. Um, so we, for some time, uh, I and my uh, poor collaborators have been looking at the security of device interfaces of cryptographic hardware, okay? So all kinds of cryptographic hardware, things like smart cards, little USB authentication tokens, and big things like HSMs and this kind of stuff. Uh, and in a paper at CCS in 2010, we showed how to find a whole bunch of different uh, attacks, which were logical attacks, okay? So they were mistakes in the ways that keys were managed and the ways that roles were assigned to keys uh, that allows you to get hold of a key in the clear outside the device, which is what these devices are, are meant not to do, okay? Uh, and so the outcome of this paper was that we were able to show how, with very careful configuration of these devices, you can prevent these kind of things from occurring, okay? That's good. So we have these proofs of security, but they're all in the abstract model of cryptography, the sort of Dolev Yao style high level model of crypto. Uh, and so we would like to transfer these results to the standard model of cryptography, okay? But we've got a big problem, which is uh, pretty much all the devices we look at use PKCS1 version 1.5 padding to encrypt uh, keys for, for import, okay? So these keys are supposed to remain secure. And of course, we all know that uh, PKCS1 1.5 padding doesn't enjoy uh, CCA security, so this prevents us from getting the kind of security proofs that we would like to have. So why is it that, um, that these devices are still using this old padding mode? So perhaps it's because they consider that the, the best known attack on this, uh, on this scheme, which is Blackenbacker's million message attack, is not a practical threat because, okay, so a smart card, for example, does about 100 private key uh, RSA operations, decryptions per second. So if you're going to execute the million message attack, it's gonna take you about a month, right? By which point, we assume the user of the smart card gets a bit suspicious, okay? So, so the contribution of this paper is to show a way to execute the million message attack in slightly under 15,000 messages. Uh, and so the hope of this is this will help people to remove uh, PKCS1 1.5 from the standards and we can have something else and then we can get our security proofs to go through, okay. All right, um, so just uh, if I could ask for a little bit of uh, cooperation. So can you raise your hand if you already know what PKCS1 1.5 padding looks like? Okay, that's pretty good. So Matthew Green told me on Twitter it would be about 40% and I can see he was, uh, he was just about right. Uh, and can you put your hand up again if you're familiar with how the Bleichenbacher attack works? Okay, okay, pretty good, okay, so I can go through that quite fast. All right, so we've got a, a, a public key uh, pair, a private key and a public key, and following Blackenbacher's presentation, we're gonna talk about the byte length of uh, the modulus n, uh, and we're gonna call it k, and we've got some plain text we would like to encrypt, okay, which is, has to be less than uh, k minus 11. Uh, it's a plain text p of length l, so how does this work in PKSS 1, 1 1.5? So we're going to generate k minus l minus three pseudo-random non-zero padding bytes, and we're gonna put them in a string called ps, and then the block that we're gonna encrypt is gonna look like this. It's gonna start with a zero, then it's gonna have a two, then it's gonna have all these non-zero padding bytes, and then a zero that marks the beginning of the plain text, and then the plain text is, is the last part on the right, okay? And that's, that's how it works. Okay, so now uh, we go back to 1998. Bill Clinton is the president. A company called Google is just being founded, and little knowing that he would be working for Google 14 years later, Daniel Bleichenbacher is presenting this attack. So we want to attack some ciphertext C and discover what the plaintext M is that's inside the ciphertext, okay? So we know M is equal to C raised to the decryption exponent D modulo N, and we assume we have access to a padding oracle, okay? So we know what a padding oracle is. We even have songs about them. It's an oracle which is going to decrypt a ciphertext and return true just when the result is a correctly padded plaintext, okay? So it's not gonna tell us what the plaintext is, it's just gonna say yes, that thing is a correctly padded plaintext. So the way Blackenbacher's beautiful attack works is we're going to find some integers, s, so we work out how we're gonna find them later. We're going to send a new ciphertext, which is gonna be equal to c multiplied by s raised to the encryption exponent e, modulo n, to the padding oracle, and the oracle is then gonna decrypt that and, and it's gonna work out m prime. And m prime, of course, by the properties of this operation, is going to be equal to m times s, okay? So if the oracle tells us that the result, m prime, is a correctly padded plain text, then we have the following thing. We know that the first two bytes of m times s must be equal to 0, 0, 0, 2, okay? So then if we set b to be this uh, constant value, we, we now have this little inequality for the value of m times s. We know m times s is uh, bigger than or equal to 2b 
and less than 3b, all right? And that's, that's just from the fact that it starts with 0, 0, 0, 2, all right? That's, that's the only place that's coming from. Okay, so intuitively we can see that we've learned something about m from, from this fact, okay? We know we can find this s and, and, and it's gonna satisfy this. So what exactly have we learned about m? Well, if we look in uh, Bleichenbacher's paper, it gives this nice formula. So we, we found some si, we're gonna take the interval that we had previously and we're gonna apply this, uh, this formula to it. Uh, and if you stare at this for long enough, you could, this, this makes perfect sense. It's just, it's, it's just an elementary calculation of what, the, what, what it is that we've learned. But we haven't got time to look, to look at this for long enough, so let's just look at the intuition. The intuition is that, well, we're, we're solving R and S, and we're saying, look, we've multiplied M by some S, we've div taken away R times N for some value of R, okay, we don't know what the value of R is, but, but we've done modulo N, right? So we know we've taken away a certain integer number of Ns, and what we were left with was T, where T is between 2B and 3B, okay? So, worry about that later, but this is the intuition, okay? This, this R and this S are gonna come up again later on. So we're multiplying by S, and we're taking away R lots of N to leave something that's in the, in the right range. So help is a huge slide full of things, but uh, this is the original attack algorithm. So, but I only want you to look at a couple of things on here. So first of all, don't look at the fact there's no step one. That's, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, what's going on here is a loop, okay? And I'm trying to find more and more of these S values. And each time I'm gonna find an S in one of these three different ways. Okay, once I've got an S, I narrow the solutions, just, just using the, the formula that I showed before, and when I've only got one left, I, get, I give that as the output, that's the, that's the real value of M. Otherwise, I go back and look for more S. Okay, so there's three different ways of looking for an S value. There's step 2A, this is where I just sequentially look for, the, so I'm looking for the very first value of S, I'm looking for S1. I'm gonna start with some lower bound, don't worry where I got that from, I can, I can tell you later. Um, and I just increase S, one, 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 until eventually I find the first value of S that's gonna be S1, okay? We call that a hit when we find a, a correct value of S. Then I either have several intervals to look at afterwards or I only have one interval to look at. So why do I have several intervals? Well, this comes from the fact that there may be several possible values of R that give me a solution for a possible value of S, okay? So when that's the case, in the next step, I'm gonna have several different disjoint intervals that, that may contain the correct plain text M. So if that's the case, then I go to step 2b, and here I just keep increasing my s, so I start with s1, now I try s1 plus 1, s1 plus 2, s1 plus 3, till eventually I find the value of s2, okay, the second hit. Uh, so that's step 2b. And when I've only got one interval left, not in the first case, but when I've, for the second time I find myself with only one interval left, I've got this clever formula. So again, don't look at the detail of this too much, but the point is, what I'm doing here is I'm deciding what r is first, and then I'm looking for an s that could suit this R, okay? So I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna multiply the modulus by this, this big number R, and then I'm looking for an S that might multiply the plain text to, to fit this, okay? So how long does it take to do this attack? Well, Blackenbacker estimates in his paper two to the 20 steps uh, for arbitrary plain text, okay? So that's important, arbitrary plain text. That means the, the thing I'm trying to attack may not have been originally a PKCS1 1.5 plain text. And that would mean I had to do step one, which I didn't put on the previous slide, which would take a whole bunch of steps, okay? But anyway, he estimated two to the 20 using a variety of sort of heuristic upper and lower bounds. And this is where the name of the attack comes from, because two to the 20 is about a million, right? In the case where M is a valid plain text already, so we just implemented Blackenbacher's algorithm just as it's written in the paper, uh, and we tried with 1,000 different 1,024-bit uh, modulus values, uh, and we obtained a mean of 215,000 oracle calls uh, uh, and a median of 163. So you can see that the mean is sort of dragged upwards by some sort of outlying very large values. But the median, that means half of the possible plain text can be, can be cracked in uh, 163,000, okay? So that's, that's where we're starting from for our case. We observe that finding hits in the step 2C case, so that's the one where we set the value of R and then we look for a value of S that might suit that value of R, that's really fast, right, really fast. I mean, you only have to do a few uh, trials for each uh, hit. Um, but looking for the, the S values in step B or step 2A is very slow. I mean, essentially, you're, you're just getting, uh, as far as you know, uniformly distributed different plain text, and so it's just the probability that one of those happens to start 0, 0, 0, 2, and have no zeros in the first eight bytes, and have a zero somewhere else, all that kind of stuff. So you can work out how long you would expect that to take, and, and indeed, that's what, that's what you find. Um, so, so this part is already fast, and these, these bits are slow. There's an existing optimization uh, that appears in a paper at Chez in 2003, where these guys said, well, 
In step 2b, so this is the step where you've got lots of different intervals left, instead of just naively looking for the next s, why don't you use the clever formula from step 2c, where you set the r value and then look for the s, and use it in parallel on each of the intervals, okay? So I'm stepwise gonna try that formula on each of my remaining intervals until I get a hit. And indeed, that speeds things up quite a lot, almost a factor of two. So our work was to try to speed up step 2a, right? Because this is the last remaining really slow step. And the idea was we would try and use this, this clever reasoning where we, where we set the value of r in advance and then look for the s on step 2a. But of course, it doesn't work. I mean, otherwise, I, I assume Bleichenbacher would have done that in the first place. It doesn't work because the range of possible values for m is too large. So, so all your intervals overlap. You, you, you end up with a, just doing exactly the same naive search that you would have done before. So what can we do about this? Well, we're going to use this proposition. So we propose, if I can find two co-prime integers u and t that satisfy this uh, inequality, uh, and this one, uh, and if I can find m and m times u times t to the minus one modulo n such that these are both PKCS1 1.5 conforming, then m is divisible by t, okay? Magic. Um, so why is this true? Well, the proof is elementary, essentially, so it, it just relies on the, on, the, on the use of these particular inequalities, uh, so I'll have to go through it very fast, but uh, so we know m times u is less than m times 3 times c because of that one, we know that's less than 3b, 3t, by the fact that m is conforming, and we know that's less than n because of that inequality there, thus we have mu modulo n is just equal to mu without the modulo. Then we have, if we set x to be m times u t to the minus 1 mod n, we know x is less than 3b because it's a conforming plain text, so we know x times t is less than 3b times t, which is less than n by this formula here. So xt mod n is equal to xt. So xt equals xt mod m, which is equal to mu mod n. So I'm just using the fact that t has to be the inverse of t minus 1 in the Zn star group, which is equal to mu outside the modulus, which implies that t divides m, right? Because t can't divide u because they're co-prime. Ta-da. Um, so what's the use of this little proposition? Well, what this means is if I can find u and t that satisfy uh, this property, so m u t to the minus 1 is conforming, then I can trim the range for m, okay? Because the consequences of, the, of, this, of these two things both being conforming is that I know that m must be greater than or equal to 2b times t over u and less than 3b times t over u, okay? So I can bring up the bottom bound by using a t bigger than u, and I can lower the top bound by using a t smaller than u. Uh, and note that I can test this just by uh, using ciphertext which are equal to c times u raised to the e, times t raised to the minus e, okay? Uh, now remember that for a successful s, we have to have some solution to this equation. So we have m times s minus some r times n is in the 2b, 3b range. Uh, so given that we've trimmed the first interval to some range a, b, this gives us a series of possible bounds for the value s, okay? So given some particular r, it must be some, somewhere in between uh, these two values. And note further that if there's a gap between the upper bound for r and the lower bound for r plus 1, then this, when we have a hole of values where there can't possibly be an s, okay? So that means when we're searching for s, we can just jump over that, that range and not bother looking for the s value there. Uh, and that's it. It turns out that makes a massive difference to the efficiency of the, of the attack. So how much difference does it make? Um, well, so first of all, we found that in practice, the implementations of PKCS1 1.5 padding are quite different, and they often reveal more information about the, the plain text than, than the original paper would, would suggest if you just look at the, the, the perfect implementation of the, of the padding check. So uh, we're going to characterize these different implementations. Not, uh, we're not characterizing all implementations, but just the ones that we found. So we assume that they all allow a correct plain text where P is of the correct length for the operation, okay? So, Often we know what length the plaintext should be. For example, we're importing a 128-bit AES key. It should be a 128-bit plaintext that we get. So all of our oracles that we found ad admit these correctly padded plaintexts. Then we're interested in ones which also allow us to have a zero somewhere in the first uh, eight bytes. So you're not supposed to have a zero in the first eight bytes, but we found some oracles that either give you a different error message, which of course is already enough for you to know that, that, that you've passed the first part of the padding, or, or in fact let it go through. Uh, then we have a second uh, flag for whether the implementation allows you to have a plain text of length zero, right? So there's no zero at all anywhere in the, um, anywhere in, the, in fact, that's an undefined length of the plain text. There's no zero at all anywhere in the block here. Uh, and we found implementations which allow you to have uh, any length you like for P. 
Uh, okay, so any correctly padded block with any length of plain text, okay? So under that setting, the original uh, Black and Backer Oracle was an FFT Oracle. So it disallows ones where there's a zero in the, in the padding. It disallows plain text with an undefined length, but it does allow you to have a plain text of any given length, okay? So under the original attack, we had a mean and a median like this, 215,000, 163,000. With our algorithm, we have a mean of 49,000 and a median of 14,500, okay? Uh, so what's going on here? So here we have an implementation where anything is allowed that starts 0, 0, 0, 2, okay? So ones which have got zeros in the wrong place, ones which have no zeros at all, and ones which have any length, uh, okay? So this is a, a really bad implementation of PKCS1 1.5 panning because it means that you, you find loads of hits when you, when you go looking with the black and backer algorithm, and the median, look, is only 3,768. So remember, this is a, a one-bit leak, and we're trying to attack a thousand-bit plaintext, and we're only taking, you know, essentially less than four uh, operations to find each bit of the plain text. So this is really very uh, efficient. So where do these uh, um, things occur? Well, here are some devices that we tested. Um, so here we're just, uh, so just on the right here, I'm not gonna have time to talk about this today, but we did also look for, for the Vodene uh, CBC padding attack, and we found this on a couple of devices. Uh, here we sh these are different kinds of keys. So a token key is, is PKCS11 language for a long-term key, and a session key is, a, is an ephemeral key. Um, so not a, NA means they don't allow you to have this kind of key. These Xs here are to show that these devices actually uh, don't implement any padding check. They just take whatever turns out to be the rightmost bits of the result of the, PK, of the RSA private key op operation and turn that into the key, no matter what it is. So, I mean, that's a bit bizarre, but, but it doesn't allow the attack, so that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> um, uh, but these other ones allowed the attack, uh, but they implement different kinds of oracles. So here are the different kinds of oracle. So for example, um, the Siemens Card OS implementation and the RSA Secure ID 800 implementation are perfect 0002 prefix oracles. So they admit the most efficient version of the attack. Uh, and so these timings are taken from the real devices doing the private key operations on the devices. So this is where this bizarre headline figure that came out of the New York Times about cracking your RSA ID in, in less than 15 minutes came from. So it does indeed take 13 minutes to do this, um, this padding oracle attack. But you know, just to be very clear, this does only give you the symmetric key from inside the plain text. It doesn't give you the private key. It doesn't give you the seed for your secure ID, six digit number, or any of this stuff. Uh, okay, so I've got a little bit of time, not very much. I'll just say there is an Estonian ID card. It has a chip on the back. It also implements RSA uh, 1.5 padding. It has a key which you can use for signature and encryption decryption, which means that you can use it to fake signatures. Um, very quickly about countermeasures. So, of course, OAP has been in PKCS1 since uh, 1998. It's been recommended for all new applications since 2002. Only one device in our list supports it, but it insists that all keys also allow PKCS1 1.5 padding as well, right? So what's the consequence of that? It means that whatever you encrypt under OAP, I can still use Blykenbacher's padding oracle attack to crack it and find out what the plain text was. So there's not much point doing it that way. Uh, I don't have time to talk about that so much. PKCS1 1.5 is still being used in current standards for XML encryption, TLS, and our results, of course, also apply there, right? And you will see in the coming months uh, results on XML encryption and TLS uh, appearing in various places. Uh, manufacturer reaction has been varied, some positive, some less, so we can talk about that offline. Uh, pro tip, so this isn't the optimal attack. I'm sure this can be improved further. If you want to improve it further, please observe you don't really need to implement encryption and decryption, right? Because if you're just testing the attack, you know what the plain text is. You can just multiply it and, and divide it yourself. So I'm not going to say at what point during our experiments this occurred to us, but uh, <laughs> it, it could have been earlier. Um, and read very carefully Blackenbacher's paper. L words like the smallest integer greater than x divided by y. Think about very carefully about what that means, because that actually makes a big difference to the efficiency of the attack. Thank you very much. <laughs>